Mexico. And one in Cuba. And we were together. And these are the dates of yep. our, uh, our last Cuba trip. Yeah. So I went to Bolivia with my son when he was down there. And uh, to Belize, Cuba, Mexico. All right. So we're going to have a word of prayer and just jump right in because we got a lot we can say. Father, we thank you that we can talk about missions. You were the first missionary. You were a global trotter, as they would say, coming across the cosmos to this very needy land called planet Earth, a planet that was full of sin and rebellion. And you came to evangelize us with the good news of the gospel. And we're just so grateful. And Lord, then you call us to go, starting in our own neighborhoods and expanding out further. So Lord, we just ask you to bless us as we share the story of how we uh, were able to do some of that and the blessings that happened to us and invite others to consider too. May your will be done. Guide us with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning. Um, in um, Matthew... Step up here until, until I get the hand held. In Matthew 5, um, or excuse me, Mark 5, it talks about the, the, um, about the demoniac. And then the demoniac... He's ta uh, talking, and the Lord has saved him. And then toward the end of that chapter, you know, one of the things that he wanted to go back with the Lord, he goes, Lord, you know, let me go with you, let me go with you. And the Lord said, no. He goes, go and tell the people about what we, about what we have, have done for you. And that is what we're doing today. We're talking about the Lord, what the Lord has done for us. You know, and uh, we like to think that we went to Cuba and we helped them. But I think I got a lot more out of it <laughs> than what the Cuban people did. Amen. Yeah. We're blessed to give than receive, as the book says. Again, this is that verse, Mark five nineteen. This is us arriving in Mexico, oh, or Cuba. in Cuba, excuse me. Um, you see these buses off on the back corner, right back there? That's not our bus. <laughs> <laughs> you see that nice one next to it? That's not our bus either. Uh, these are some of the guys. This is Will and uh, Jonathan. Vincent Jonathan, back there yeah, Jonathan. Time. You see Jonathan way in the back. This is our bus driver. Are you guys ready? That is our bus. That's our bus. <laughs> <laughs> That's our transportation. That's yep. our transportation for from the 27th through the 16th, from 27th of February to the 16th of March. That is our transportation. That's where we got from one place to the other. You can see it's got an ambulance sign yeah. on the front there. It looked like it was conversion of a ambulance to a school bus to, I don't know, to kind of put it all together, I guess. <laughs> all right. That is the front of it. For you guys who are automobile enthusiasts, I have no idea what year this is. I'm guessing 1950-something. All right. All right. Uh, it's, uh, um, and that was our form of transportation. As we go through here, this is what some of the city looks like. It's warm out there as we go through. Uh, looking at the everything, this is one of their forms of transportation. I thought I'll take a picture of that. That's a pretty unique. That's pretty neat, All right? And then, uh, then I saw this one. Electrical. <laughs> They're doing a lot of electrical stuff now. Yeah. And then we saw this. That's a conference office. They got a grant from some conference or union. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can't still can't hear me. How many? How many here are having a hard time hearing us this morning? <laughs> Okay. And that's another form of the transportation I just showed you right here. This is another form of transportation. They're all over. Yeah. I mean, this is a, a single man tax person taxi. All right. Well, oh, oh, excuse me. Here's another form of transportation. <laughs> this is for a family. <laughs> very vehicle. common. That's not very... just a tourist one and done deal. It's like a lot of those are on the street. And for those of you looking in the background, see the mo old motorcycle back there? Yeah. We'll be talking about that here some more later. But these are all different forms and different modes of transportation that they have there um, that we were familiar with. This area that we're going through, and you see Fred on the side. Um, Fred on the left Fred here. Fred on the left side there. He's a you know, um, this is where they take the tourists. Yeah. Just so is, you know, Fred, Fred's a general contractor from Arkansas is with our, our group. So it was good. him and his son came, and it was great. But tell them about that avenue. Yeah, this is a avenue. In fact, uh, as we go down, in fact, the next picture will show it. Uh, this is Fred. We're walking down. This is where they bring the tourists and all the stuff. It's a really nice, beautiful, paved area. 
And then you probably recognize the guy in the red shirt yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. And the guy on the, on the, beside him is the is a elder of the church there where we're in the town. And, and in the background, you see the statue back here? See that, that statue there? That is our influence on the rest of the world. That is promoting transgenderism. Yeah. You know, yeah. so. Uh, and, disappointing. Yeah, it is sort of disappointing. This, uh, by the way, is some of the nicer area. And this was pre-revolution. So what you see there, the nice buildings and stuff like that are prior to the communist revolution. They really don't have much nice after that. And I'm, this is myself. I'm pointing to the area that we're in, Holguin. It's, uh, I think, the second largest city. Third, third, uh, third largest yeah. city in Cuba, right? One million population. This is downtown, more part of the same downtown. Uh, this is a, a statue of a general that fought for the freedom back in the 1700s, 1800s. Uh, and he's, uh, uh, they got the statue commemorating him in, that, in the park there in the area. Uh, this is a church. I thought, um, I sort of, my, my background is drafting design. And so I really like architecture and stuff like that. So you see some of these old buildings, I think, you know, they have a lot of character. I think it's really neat to watch them. Um, I saw a building similar like this in the Alamo, believe it or not. You know, and I thought, hey, this is pretty cool. I really like it. Um, but this church is probably 200 years old. So they had, they've had an influence there for several hundred years. But a guy, who, who's the automobile enthusiast? What year is that? Anybody know? This is one of the, this is a conference car, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, this is what the, the conference president drives. Um, originally, I'm sure it had a gas engine. Now it has a diesel engine in it. Um, yeah, and uh, it does. I, I never wrote it, but the pastor did write it. Yes. Um, has air conditioning, so it's all it has all the amenities and stuff like that. Shots but that's how they do. Shot. They do not, you know, they continue to fix things yeah. up. And like you might have a Chevy vehicle, but it might have a Ford engine in it. It might be a originally had a gas engine. It might have a diesel. They just keep on modifying Adapting. and making them work yeah. as a form of transportation. Mm -hmm. All right. This is the area that we're staying at. Uh, these two buildings, the blue buildings in the back. Again, you can see our major form of transportation are the back of our bus, right? This taller building, that's our conference headquarters for the area. Uh, that's where we stayed. And I'll be honest with you, this is the best accommodations I've ever had on a missionary trip. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Usually I have a three-man dome tent and I stuff an air mattress in and I, that's I my accommodations. Uh, these were very nice, very good accommodations. But there were some hiccups, and we'll talk about those yeah. here as we progress. Again, I, I, had, I just couldn't get enough pictures of our bus, you know. That was a uh, uh, – oh, by the way, the bus don't have bus seats. They took chairs uh, that you would have for like, uh, uh, for like your dining room chairs, and they welded them to the floor. <laughs> so, and then uh, the chairs they could take them out so they could put more stuff in the bus and whatever if that has four wheels and maybe a motor that's a form of transportation there's no safety no there's no safety laws but you have to wear a seat belt or whatever and we'll talk about that here soon too again you can see different forms of transportation and part of the town this is a town in the evening I'm looking at the sunset um, you see salesmen uh, of, of fruit uh, people at the fruit markets and stuff like that, right? This is their fruit market. The guy, <laughs> in this case, this guy had uh, a bunch of garlic over his shoulders and stuff like that, and he's selling garlic, and he's yelling, you know, for sale, for sale. And he's uh, It's a mobile market, too. <laughs> <laughs> very very mobile. Someone calls him up, asks him, he breaks off some cloves of, of garlic and sells it to him. Uh, uh, it just, uh, I thought it was really interesting. I'll show you some. Uh, By the way, he's got something on that cost him a month's wages. Shoes. Shoes. Closed toe shoes cost a month's worth of wages there. Yeah. Not a lot of them wear closed toe shoes. Right. It's, uh, it's sort of interesting when you start talking to him. And, uh, uh, and I'll show you some of that inf information, too. This is Mrs. Dynamo. <laughs> uh, she is a union conference uh, treasure, right? Huh? Treasure. Treasure. She's a treasure. Uh, she uh, also dresses up. Um, uh, she has two children. She dresses up as a clown. She goes to the children's hospitals and and encourages the kids and entertains the kids. She does 
uh, cooking. She heads up the cooking. I'll talk about that because the food is really good there. Uh, she is just really enthusiastic. And just how you see her right now, this is her all the time. Yeah. I mean, we come in uh, and we'll talk about how we work late nights, late, long days. Uh, she is always enthusiastic, always excited, always, you know, reaching out and trying to help somebody somehow, some way. It was nothing short of fantastic. Mm -hmm. They would, uh, she was on the kitchen crew for us to serve us. They would get up way in the morning before we were up. And then they would stay until we got home sometimes eight o'clock at night, nine o'clock, nine thirty. They're, they're finishing up, cleaning up. Uh, no complaints. The happy to serve. Happy to serve. Absolutely. Oh. You would love the Cuban people. They are wonderful. Yeah. Government, mm, but Cuban <laughs> people, A plus. Wonderful yeah. people. The, Brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah, they're fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and you can see behind her, there's a gentleman there. He's eating out of a tray, and that's what they brought us. We're on the site. We're building the church. Excuse me? I'm wrong? Right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah, we're not church. They, we don't use we're not, that. We're not allowed to build churches in Cuba. That's big trouble if you use that language yeah, there. Yeah, the, we don't build churches in Cuba. We build buildings, garages. You know? And so if we built, you call them churches, then you're in trouble. Yep. The government doesn't, does not allow that. does not encourage religion. So we build buildings. Our lawyer was, uh, they have a conference lawyer, um, and he was very careful to legally study everything out. And when he submitted, you know, uh, for permits to build a garage. And uh, so by their law, there's nothing to stop them from allowing us to do that. And they said, we know what you're really doing. We know what you're really building a church, but legally there's nothing we can do to stop you. Um, but they did try. We'll talk about that. Yeah, yeah uh, it's really interesting. Um, one of the things that I want to talk just a little bit about Cuba, Does anyone, is anyone here familiar with communism? Okay. It's nothing like what you hear on the TV or the radio. You know, uh, you don't, you know, they have stuff. And for example, we have, uh, if we have, how many people can go out and buy gas today? So if they run out of gas in one of your gas stations today, what do you do? Go another one. In Cuba, when they run out of gas, they're out of gas. They don't go, there's no other one to go to because they're out. There's nothing there until the next shipment comes in. You know, and then it's rationed. They're only allowed to get so much. And so, uh, because it's rationed and stuff, so they have to, they're always thinking ahead. And so they're very innovative. So there are certain things, Cubans, that we take for granted that we can't do. For example, you know what this lady's doing? That's laundry. You know why she's doing it this way? They don't have soap. She's scrubbing things with a brush and water and cleaning clothes. That's how they do laundry in Cuba. And, and I didn't realize this. I didn't find out until when I got the slides later that this was what she was doing. Because I'd take all my clothes and I'd put them up, put them on a bundle, put my name on, set it out in the stairway. And the next day, by the time I got home that same day, my clothes were all clean, folded, and ready to be used again. That Not day. that, but Lloyd made it really hard on her because he was doing the saw on the cement blocks and got cement all over that cement dust, which is really hard to clean, really hard to clean off the pants. And she was scrubbing it out. Yeah. Uh, and you'll see some pictures of uh, my nickname was Dusty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Again, this is, uh, what was her name? Y Yamani or? Amani, Yamania. Yamani. Yamania, yep. Uh, and uh, this is her stand in front of the company. And this is how they delivered the food to us. This is our main dining area. Every morning, uh, we come in this area. They fix this up just recently. Not, it's not that old of a building. Uh, we'd come in. First thing we do every morning, you get up early in the morning, you go in there. We get around in a circle. Um, we'll, we'll do worship, sing some songs, do some prayers. And Rich will tell us what we're going to do today. And Rich is, has everything planned down to the detail. But all things are subject to change without notice. Am I right? Yeah. What's his what's his, what's his model? Um, We're highly structured. Highly but, structured, but flexible. Yeah. <laughs> and in Cuba, you better be flexible, or you're nothing. And and um, <laughs> so. guys, um, and it's when you see this happening, and you see these changes happen day by day by day, and you you see the Lord working out things before yeah. we even have a chance to think about them. And this is the blessing that we get from work, doing this kind of work. Amen. It is unbelievable. Yep. Why they're preparing here, they're preparing meals. We sit down in here, we all eat together. They have LP gas. We're all familiar with that, right? LP gas. 
So they get a hundred pound cylinder before we get there to have LP gas so they could do all our cooking. And like I said a minute ago, you know, they run out of, uh, at six days, six or six or eight days into our trip, they run out of gas. Yes. Yeah. They can't, you know, so we would think, well, what do they do? How do they cook? There you this, go. <laughs> they go from gas. Now they go to charcoal. <laughs> Start up. You see the pot? See those pots? That was how much food they had to prepare to feed us. Yeah. There was only 16 of us, but we had another team of four. Uh, initially, we had like 10 more. But mm -hmm. uh, the group that they hired was unionized, some of them, because... And then they went on strike because they wanted to, they didn't agree to the terms that they agreed to. They wanted to raise it by another 250% or yeah. something like yeah. that. Oh, uh, I can, let's talk about yeah, that. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Little, well, let me get one more side. I got one more side, and then we're going to talk about that, right? Yeah. All right. This is what they prepared. This is a, a daily meal for us, usually awesome. our dinner. Um, on there, you can see you can see the black beans. You can see the bread is like a more like a French type bread sliced up. The stuff they got on there was uh, uh, it was a mixture of garlic and mayonnaise and stuff like that. I fell in love with good. it. It was delicious. absolutely delicious. Yeah. You got fresh pineapple, fresh mm -hmm. tomatoes, fresh cucumbers every day. Tomato, yeah, that tomatoes. Oh, it was oh. awesome. By the way, and, that's not how they live. They went to the black market to buy food to supplement it so that we could eat like Americans while they in Cuba do not live this way. Uh, and you'll see later on Cuba and Cuba, the average person, they're allowed five eggs a month. Five eggs a month. I don't know about you, but a lot of times I eat three egg omelets. <laughs> All right. So, so you got the idea? Uh, this is their market. In the morning, the market would open up. This door would uh, come up. The market is not as wide as that pew right there is. You now, as you can see, uh, this is sort of unusual. You see a, a, not very many adults wear shorts. They usually wear long pants. I don't know why. Um, but this person this morning, in, this, in the morning, they sell their meats. All right? And once they run out of meat, they're all done. And then they sell soft drinks and candy bars or whatever. Yeah, and that and that, but that's it. And so usually this is all done by before noon, and then they sell their refreshments or whatever. All right. Now, this is the this is a Cuban influence. Ring a bell. Ring a bell. Anybody know that? Come on, old guys, you should know some of this. Yeah, Che. He's the guy who was one of the revolutionaries that um, back when that encouraged the, the transfer to communism, and they have these set in different places in, the, in it. So he um, also was, uh, I think, the CIA yeah, yeah, had him killed in Venezuela. He was trying to agitate Venezuela to become communistic, and so our, our government took him out. I, but I guess he took a lot of people out too. I'm, I wasn't familiar with that side of the story. So, but again, uh, you see these. Um, you know, they all have big signs, and we saw banners that says. Uh, Gracias, Fidel. Fidel. Gracias. Thank you, Fidel, for uh, the freedoms we have as Cubans, or whatever we have. And, and, and they and don't what, have much, I got to tell you. And truthfully, what they did is they took a whole population of people yeah. and made them all poor. Yeah. Right. So, and to emphasize that, here it is: average doctor's income per month, fifty dollars per month. Yeah. Teachers' income. $35 per month. Average income, 2,000 pesos. Oh, now let me talk to you about the pesos. I, go, I went and I took, I, they said, do you want pesos? Yeah, I'm going to change them. I gave them 20 pesos, or $20, not pesos, $20. They, came, they gave me 3,340 pesos for a $20 bill. You know, they think, wow, that's a lot of money. Yeah, and they get a lot of money about almost as thick as this. <laughs> that's a big you know, wad. <laughs> you know, and you think, wow, that's a lot of money, but wait till you go to buy something, because you go buy a um, uh, 170 rate peso chain, cost for a t-shirt, 2,000 pesos. That's a month's wages for a t-shirt, right? Also, cost for a pair of shoes is 10,000 pesos. That's five months. Okay, wages. that's more, yeah. Five months wages. In fact, we were in a, plan, a place, and we'll show it to you here in a minute, and one of the guys are talking to us about, about oh, how they can't afford to do this and do that. And one of our members, or, uh, yeah, one of our members, uh, literally took off his shoes and gave them to the man so he could have shoes. 
So it's uh, interesting. Cost of an egg, about 50 cents per egg. You know, eggs aren't a big thing there. You know. This is a, a needs list here. Um, oh, this is a, excuse me, I, re, um, I need to correct. Rations list. This monthly mash, uh, rations list, unless otherwise, you know, five pounds of rice, 30 grams of beans, which 30 grams of beans are about what you can hold in your hand. Um, uh, four pounds of sugar, eight ounces of oil, um, and one kilo of salt for three months, one tube of toothpaste for three months, 16 ounces of chicken, two cups of chicken when you can get it, and, um, and five eggs per month. You can buy all the fresh fruits and veggies, and, and they really protect their trees, the mango trees, and uh, it was great, wasn't it? <laughs> we're up there eating, and there's so much that we take for granted, but yet, you know, we're up there, we're eating for fresh, almost on a daily basis, we're having fresh papaya, mm -hmm. fresh mangoes, fresh pineapple, fresh, and then sometimes, um, what was the one that you liked? The, Passion guava? fruit, and there's uh, guava. 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 Yeah. You know, guava I nectar. love fresh pineapple juice, and it's like, now I'm telling you, if you go, if you eat <laughs> fresh day. pineapple juice in Cuba, and you come back and you drink the stuff they yeah, have here, yeah. it's like, yuck. <laughs> no comparison. And it's like, oh, this isn't it. You know, and uh, and uh, the pastor liked the guava. I yeah. believe it was oh, the guava so juice. It was yeah. just fantastic. Guava nectar. And uh, and and it's like, <clears throat> so they, you know, they, they'll see a tree and they'll try to do everything they can, they can to protect that tree that has a fruit on it because that's food for them. So communism here is a, you know, this is supposed to be a. Uh, a thing that, you know, it's good, communism good, right? Because they're going to take care of you. That's how they take care of you. And so at the mental hospital, largest mental hospital in Cuba was in Hogan. And uh, they had about 20 people die from malnutrition in a year. I think it's a year's time. I'm not sure. It might have been less than that. And there was a lady who was a church member who was crying because her son had some mental health issues. And they wanted to put him into that mental hospital. But she was afraid he was going to die because that he wouldn't get enough nutrition. So it's a very real issue, uh, not having enough food. But and all, the other thing, too, is we heard this story several times, <clears throat> that if you're a parent and you have children, you won't have enough food to feed them all. So the parent would often alternate and say, who's going who's gonna to skip mood, food today for the sake of the kids? So I'll do it today, you do it tomorrow. Sometimes the kids would have to miss a day, too. But uh, that's not uncommon over there. There's not really a problem with obesity because there's just not enough calories to make anybody that way. So it's a real, it's a real issue. It's a real problem. Oh, one other thing, too, that uh, Rojan's not here. She was oh, a physician's was. assistant. I know I miss, we miss her. But she said that she was observing these kids, and they had a kind of behavior like uh, uh, Asperger's. <clears throat> so she thought, well, they, they must have Asperger's syndrome. <clears throat> that we took thousands of pounds, uh, no, we took uh, hundreds of pounds, well, close to a thousand pounds of beans and rice and other things. And as the church gave it out, they gave it out to these neighbors. And uh, the next day, the kids were running around and having a great time. And she said, what, what happened? These guys were yesterday. The difference was they had food this day. Now they had energy. They could go play like normal kids. But the rest of the time, they're short on food. And so they're just not very much energy. And it's a real problem. Yeah, that's what it is. Uh, and, um, now, this is the, the rations they're talking about. This is what the government gives them. And then you have to use part of your $2,000 average income to buy any extra vegetables or whatever. So, you know, that's how it is. Okay, and then here, um, this is what they need. You know, look up there uh, for an example, laundry soap. We talked about that. They can get it. They have to go on the black market. And uh, the black market's a, a sort of a funny thing. We'll talk about that in a minute. Personal hygiene stuff, dish soap, vitamins. Tylenol, you know, Tylenol, you know, they, we take that. Over the we, counter. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah we, we take it. I probably have a couple bottles of them at home, yeah. you know, and they can't get them. You know. It's just as bad for if you're a doctor and you want to prescribe some medicine, where are you going to get it from? They largely don't have it. So going to the doctor and getting a prescription doesn't do much for you. You go to the market to get over-the-counter stuff in the black market because you're not going to get it otherwise. Um, uh, soap, shampoo, lotions, um, shaving cream, flip-flops for the kids, undergarments for the kids and adults, you know, they're looking for, you know, and, you know, the girls look for them, the boys look for them, everybody's looking for nothing. So one of our girls, uh, Tammy, she's a social worker, uh, she brought in some panties. She thought, you know, it'd be kind of fun to give the girls some panties and stuff like that. 
So then she discreetly tried to give some to the girls, and then the guys found out, and the guys, they said, this is what they said, we would not be opposed to wearing girls' panties if we could just have any underwear at all. And that's a real issue, you know? We take it for granted. We take so much for granted in this country. Um, it's amazing. Um, this is some of the signage I thought was sort of interesting, a stop sign and a one-way sign. Again, here again. Uh, these folks, uh, they the Cuban people love to sing. They right, sure Pastor? do. Amen. <laughs> they do. <laughs> and they, you know, they they when they sing, they sing. Yeah, and uh, right. I think this is yes, this is it. Here, just listen to them sing for just a moment, folks. Uh, I don't have the volume. Um. That's right. We'll have to continue on. But um, I was hoping to have you guys hear, hear they sing because they just sing out and they sing. They love their music. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of a one of our pastors what was talking down there. He says, you know, he goes, you you sing for an hour and a half and then you preach for for thirty minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, so good. Uh, it was just so neat. Uh, again, these are the folks here, and you can see the elder, the guy. Uh, the younger guy, he, he loves to sing, and he was one of our tour guides early on. This so is, while we're talking about singing, huh? because we got to leave in five minutes, I guess, do we want to sing that song? I, this is a song that's the number one song, I think, for Hispanic Adventists uh, in uh, Hispanic lands. So it's uh, Far Beyond the Sun. It's called Masa Yel del Sol. Uh, you should have uh, the words somewhere. Do you have it in your bulletins? Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, I'm sorry, my bad. Okay, never mind, moving on. <laughs> like, go ahead, go ahead, Lloyd. We'll go ahead. Go ahead. We're not going to do it. All right. Uh, this is Holguin, uh, the, the site of the city. Um, it's just a, a very large city. We're on top of the hill. This is where uh, uh, they call that, I don't remember, oh, the crosses. On top of the hill, Las so they have a cross up there. And I went up the hill and it's like, where's the cross? And then they showed it to me. It's like, oh, okay. Um, you can see the city again. Um, very beautiful, a lot of flowers, very tropical, you know, things like that. Uh, there's 448 or 748 steps here. Um, I didn't count them. Excuse me, 498 steps here. Uh, they call it the 500 steps. The pastor uh, counted them, that's how I know. <laughs> It was a workout. We get towards the top. So I, I walked down. Good, good I went workout. all the way down, went all the way up, and it's a, quite a workout. This is our group here. Uh, you can see the group. Um, the gentleman right here, you see with the phone, he is the attorney. And uh, when I first met him, I'm looking at him, I'm thinking of, of a used car salesman. Mm -hmm. you know? And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, okay. And was I in for a surprise? This guy's a dynamo. Yep. Yes. Yeah, he is a dynamo. This guy is there. It's like, oh, you want to... How many churches you want to build? You tell me how many you will build. I will get you the permit. You know, and he's and the conference president's like, whoa, 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 slow down, slow down. You know, and it's like, you know, no, no, we can't slow down. We got to get the message out. We got to get the work done. All right. And it was just like, and then his daughter, who's there to his right, uh, she's son to be an attorney also, and that's his son. Uh, again, you can see um, Scott and Tammy out here. You can see Rojun. I wish yeah. uh, Rojan. Rujan, uh, behind Rich. Uh, I wish he could have been here. Uh, she adds so much to this. She does. And then you see Rich, Pam, Will, um, Jonathan kneeling down with Adam, and the pastor there in the back, you know. Um, the Estados. The Estado. The Estado standing there. The Estado is probably the hardest working man I've ever seen. He's in from life. Cuba. He's, He's a, from Cuba. Amazing. Hard, and work, hard worker. Then you see uh, Jeremiah. I wish he was here also. Yeah. And then Fred. This Jeremiah is, wasn't even a seventh day Adventist. He heard on Strong Tower Radio. He called in and said, I want to go. So he went down to Mexico. And then when he found about Cuba, he said, I want to go. So, uh, you know, God's working on his heart. So. Uh, he is, a, <clears throat> he, he's again a fantastic guy. And then Fred, these are some of the same guys. Also, we have uh, er, Kiki Eric on the right, yeah. Enrique, Enrique. Enrique. Yeah. Uh, Enrique was, uh, he stayed for a week. We were there for like two and a half weeks. Uh, he was there for a week. And Rich kept telling us, like, you're going to wish you could say, you're going to wish you could say. And then 
when he got ready to go, he goes, oh, I wish I could stay. Yeah. You know, and he was one of our interpreters. And this is how the Lord provides. It's really interesting. The Lord is providing. As you see, Enrique was our interpreter there. And we're wondering, well, once he leaves, we're losing someone who can speak who's bilingual. He spoke very well. He's very fluent. And then you see the gentleman standing there with the black. His name's Oscar. And we don't think anything of it. And as soon as Enrique left, Oscar starts stepping up and doing the interpretation. Oscar taught himself how to speak English, mm -hmm. reading, believe it or not, the Bible and reading dictionaries. Taught himself how to do it. Here we are. Uh, we're banning, this, is, this is the cement mixers. <laughs> the original cement mixer. Now tell the story about the union. All right, so the union guys, they, I think we agreed to $20 a month for yeah. them. The right. going rate is $20 a month. We still pay you 20 even though you can only work for two weeks. So after a couple of days, they said, you know what? We want $20, or was it $25 a day? We want $20 or $25 a day, or we're not working. And Rich said, great, you're not working. Because honestly, they weren't working that hard anyway. So that meant that they took the mixer with them as well, which meant that we had to hand mix, which is a whole lot more burning of energy. Uh, but you know what? <laughs> we weren't going. We had uh, a large mixer that we were just waiting for to clear customs at the port. And it was supposed to be due any day. So when this pastor in the gold shirt, when he came and he saw what we were doing, he came uh, dressed like a pastor with dress shoes and dress slacks and all that. He's like, you know what? We're not going to be defeated. And he took off his shoes and socks. And he said, we're getting in here. And he started mixing the mud with his, uh, in his bare feet. Um, it's just like, we're going to do this. Really and good. by God's grace, you know, we, we got the mixer and we just, we got through, we built four or five churches. We built five churches. Five churches in the eight garages. Sorry, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Keep us on. 18 days we were there, whatever it was. So. She's listening. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's great, garages. Now, and again, this wasn't unusual. You can see the aggregate here in front. Those are stones that we add to the concrete as we're getting ready to do what we call the bond beams and stuff like that. And um, this guy's walking barefoot through it. And when we asked him, when uh, some of the, his fellow pastors came in, he says, Pastor, he goes, you don't have any shoes on. And his comment was, Jesus didn't have shoes either. And I thought, wow, wow. That's, well, that's how important this is to those folks. Yeah. This is a picture, a closer picture I got him the next morning. This is Rich laying on there. Rich does everything. Yeah. He's not above doing anything. He's sort of leading the group, of course. And he's coordinating activities and trying to get things working and stuff like that. But Rich, you know, you'll see him carrying mud. You'll see him carrying blocks. He'll be mixing some motor. He'll be... You name it, I can't think of anything that Rich did well, not then, do yeah. or try to help. He was very active, very involved. Okay, this is uh, interesting. Uh, no, this isn't the one, but this is what the front of the church looks like. That's right. The, excuse That's me. Right. <laughs> Keep me up. <laughs> I, I love it, guys. I love it. All right. Yeah, this is, this is what the garage looks like. Doesn't that look like a garage to you? <laughs> <laughs> yep. In fact, uh, it was the story, and let me, maybe I might have it. Nope, this isn't it. All right, this is the first one we did, the first garage we built. You see that this is the outside, this is the front of outside. You know, uh, this is the other side. This building here on this side right here, oh, on that side, over here, that's the old church. It's way small. Excuse me, the old well, the church. That's the old church. That's the old church. Uh, we didn't build it. When you yeah. build new buildings, it's their garages. The old ones are. That's a, that's the old church, and it could easily fit in half the sanctuary. And it was three rooms. You know, and, uh, and, and so this is the, the new garage that we built for them. That little, the little tank you see here is a cistern that they had for the old church. We were using, it, using the water from it to build for our, our blocks and stuff like that. We used a, we used a lot of water with uh, cement. Well, we did. And stuff like that. You see the trusses inside of here? They don't have a snow load. So it just has to basically hold up for the wind, the hurricane, stuff like that. So it's good. Um, they're anchored and welded in place. By the way, we make our own trusses. The Mexico Missions does down in Tennessee. They get the metal, they roll it in, and, uh, and they cut it and all that. So all we got to do is assemble it when we get there. <clears throat> they do about, well, they can put up to 40 churches in there, but we, we send in all our own metal down in shipping containers because it's cheaper. We cut the cost by about a third. It's about $6,000 to build a church all the way out. So we praise the Lord for that. Yeah, um, and they have no, they don't have any manufacturing in Cuba, so that's why we roll everything out and send it by uh, by crate or, or or cargo car. It's a one day church. 
Well, it, it takes us three days to build a church. Excuse me. It takes yeah. us three days to build a building. But <laughs> we don't want to be confused with one-day churches because these are sturdier. Yeah. <laughs> these last a lot longer. These, these last. <clears throat> but there's uh, something, too, just to mention on this. These churches here, um, hmm. I just, just the neighborhood. We, we were short some stuff. We went out the neighborhood. They, yeah. they donated stuff for us to use and let us use it. And when we were wrapping it up, one of the things they often say when they, when they come by is go rapido, rapido. Every time they're driving somewhere and they're going to the market, they're looking at the churches they're going by because generally speaking, when they build a building, it'll take them up to three years to build it because they'll build till they run out of supplies. Then they have to wait till they can get the money to get more supplies when the supplies are available and they accumulate it and then they build some more. So the fact that we did this in three days was mind blowing to them. They've never seen it move so fast which came in handy for us because when the government inspector came and says, hey, we're pulling your permit, our lawyer said, go ahead, we're already done building the church. It's, I mean, the, the garage, it's already done. And they go, what, what? And they come and look at it. So you can got some more stories on that. But yeah. Now, uh, what, the, this is a good demonstration right here because you can see the whole other church right here. You can see where it ends, the door in the middle, and you'll see that in the next slide. But we build up, the first day the whole group is together, and we build up to the bottom of the windowsills. And then... Half the group goes to build the, the next building, and they're building up the windowsills, and the first group stays there, and they build it up all the way up to the top within the next day. And then the following day, the third day, the guys get up on the roof, and they put the roof on. So, and so it's three days. We're done. We're walking out. In this case, this is the one the pastor was talking about. We didn't have it. We got there, and we didn't have the boards to put the, support the windows. And he goes, what are you doing? He goes, well, we pray. Then we go and ask the people in the neighborhood if they have any lumber. The guy next door says, yeah, I got some, some boards. And you got to understand, and like, very much like in Mexico, in Cuba, you almost have to have a town meeting before you cut any lumber because wood is a premium. It's very expensive. It's very hard to come by. As you look around, you don't see any kind of trees that you could make lumber out of. You, know, you can't make lumber out of, of palm trees, you know. Or, and if you do, it isn't going to be very good. It's not going to last very long. So you get the idea. And so why we're finishing up, uh, people are finishing up this church. And here, you can look right through that center part of the window. Here, this is Reuben, and he's just um, taking a rest. And that's the bathroom you see right straight through there. They have a bathroom in the middle and the two rooms off each side. And you can see it's uh, very nice, huh? That's one of the better ones, right? Here it is on the front side of the church, and it was amazing. I'm, this is a, this it's getting some down. I'm taking this picture, and I'm looking, and and people are coming out. You know, and I'm looking around. It's like, uh oh, this they're causing problems. And it's like, you know, you're in a foreign country, you can't speak the language, and the last thing you want is problems. So he goes up there, and these people keep coming in. They keep coming in, coming, coming, and it's like, what's going on? And they're excited. They want to see their church. They want to go up there. They, they come to the church. The, the building's not even open yet, and they come into their church, and we all gather, the Americans, the Cubans, we gather together, and we put our arms all together, and we start singing songs, and we say a prayer, you know, because there's only one God, and he's the God over all of us, isn't he? And it's like, uh, and, it's like and I'm thinking, Wow. You know, wow, you don't see these people during the day, but at night they're coming out and they want to go to their church. Sort of humbled me a little bit. Next time I, th you know, every now and then I think, well, I don't feel like going to church today. And I think about the Cubans, you know. Here's a, a, an example of that in the light in the background. That's the moon. That's something, you know, you think, oh, we're going to go there. We're going to work for a few hours. We work until the job's done, until we can get something. In this case, we wanted to get all the walls done so the next day they could start building and working on the roof. All right? So you know, we want to get it done. So, and we had a shortage of supplies, shortage of sc uh, scaffolding, things like that. And finally, uh, we're saying, hey, we got to finish it. Let's get her done. And, uh, and as you see, the guy in the far end, Diazado, he he's like he's like let's work, let's get it done. We gotta get it done. We, you know, our brothers are looking for a church to go to, and if you see, um, let me see, nope, you can't see it. Okay, uh, if you could look a little bit to this side over here, and the picture up there isn't nearly as good as what I have on my computer. You could see the existing church. We literally built four walls around the existing church for them to go. 
This is the second church. This is a, I thought, this is a group that built. We're building up from, the, from that section on. Um, everybody's there. You see the attorney. You see the attorney, the blue shirt in the middle? He's, he's an attorney, but he's out there getting dirty just like all the rest of us and enjoying every minute of it. You know, uh, what was interesting was that this, um, the building that you see, the yellow building off the one side there, it is the, um, the house, also the sanctuary. They had like 40 members going to church in that building right there. And it was a back section, and it was maybe just a little bit bigger than the podium is here. And they'd squeeze in there and listen to what he has. And one of the stories, um, one of the kids were playing with a car, and he had an aerosol can that he was pushing around like a car. And that was what his little pretend car automobile was. And then one of the members had um, a little toy car in his luggage or something like that. The next day he brought it out and gave it to him. And that kid was driving that car all over the place. It was it's like, wow, what a blessing. This is uh, Fidel. And this, I'm just going to introduce you to some of our members. This is Fidel. He's a Cuban. Uh, great guy. Uh, this is Adam. He's an American. Um, this is Jonathan. I think you guys may know him, right? Uh, Jonathan was a Brock player. He would do about anything. You know, here he is uh, lifting him up, lifting up Mo uh, Rich, along with Enrique, our interpreter. Uh, there I am after one day. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's me working. They, call, they called me Dusty. <laughs> yeah. And what he has is everywhere. Well, I saw that picture where he had a level where the windows, and I said, you, we go up that far. You cut out all the center, the center holes on the blocks, and they fill it up with concrete, and that's a support. And then when you do the same thing on the top row of the block, and you put, fill it up with concrete, and that binds everything together. And uh, it, was, it was really for, sort of interesting. We had one of the government people saying, you have to stop building. You're, you're building a core, poor quality building. And uh, the lawyer... The attorney is going around and he's saying, no, 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 this is a great building. This is a very good building. It's really good. It's really, everything is bonded together. We're making sure it's very secure for the hurricanes and severe weather. We're doing great. And she goes, no, I'm going to, you know, it's not very good. I don't think so. And so he kept on talking to her. And the way the Lord works is, uh, is amazing because two days later, she came up, comes and shows up and she wants a picture with us and, and with the building in the background to show what we have done. Oh uh, yes, every t at the bond beam we put be uh, uh, rebar all the way through and over the doorways. We put the rebar over the top of the doorways to make sure everything's re reinforced. So it basically has double uh, rebar all the way around, uh, two rings of it all the way around with the concrete enforcement. And then um, when uh, we get on the top, we have made little metal plates that we put into the concrete, and then they weld those metal plates to the trusses to hold them all together so nothing comes off. And then they screw the trusses and get together. This is Fred and Rich. Uh, Fred was a, as a contractor. Uh, you can see Oscar starting to come in. This is us, again, it wasn't uncommon for us to mix the concrete here. This is how we mix the concrete. Jonathan got off the wall and started mixing concrete. You know. Um, they pour water into, into the bond beam before they pour the concrete to make the concrete bond to the cement blocks. This is uh, Fred eating. <laughs> uh, you can see the trays they have us. They fed us very well, guys. In fact, it got to the point I'm, I'm, I kept telling them, like, guys, you can't keep feeding me this way. You know, they're not going to understand if I go back to the U.S. Fat, fatter than I was when I left. You know? <laughs> and, uh, but uh, uh, they love feeding people. And they make pe when their goal is they make food, they want to make sure that you eat everything they have made. You know, they feel it's sort of a slight if, you're, if, you're, uh, if they have to take food back. You know, they want to make sure that everybody's well fed. Again, this is a... Oh, Pastor, I don't, um, I, I can't remember his name. He was, uh, it was really funny. Uh, you heard us talk about the black market earlier. This is the black, how the black market works in Cuba. The, um, you go up there and they don't have the, the Home Depot, they don't have the Walmarts, they don't have anything like that. So you walk on, on the streets and you walk around and you talk to different people and you say, hey, I need a pair of leather gloves. I need a pair of shoes. I need a shirt. You know, and the guy, whoever you walk up to, say, oh, you got to go, go talk to Jesus over here or Fidel over there, and they'll tell you how to find him. And then you find him on the corner, and when you find him, say, okay, I need a, a pair of shoes. And they tell you, okay, you gotta, from here, you got to go to that guy. 
and he'll be there tomorrow morning. And you tell him what size, and then when you go meet him, he gives you your shoes, you give him the money, and you go on. The government is very well aware of the, of the black market. But when you buy stuff, you got to pay taxes. That's all they're concerned. Did they pay taxes? And you have to have a receipt showing you paid taxes on whatever you bought. And one of our ministers almost got in there. Um, a lot of dogs in Cuba, uh, but they don't. They're not aggressive. I've never seen them. We got the horses walking through and stuff like that. They don't ever, I never saw one chase. I've never seen anything. They're just there. They're just a medium-sized dog, usually about, about that tall. You know, very friendly. So here we are, land. This is the third church we're working on. You can see the rebar sticking out there. Um, who asked that question about the rebar? You, know, you can see it sticking the rod, the rebar along the doorways. On both sides of the doorways, you run the rebar on. Same thing with those again. This is, this is the third, the fourth church. This is um, Will. This uh, is Jeremiah. I wish he was here. He was invited, but he had other things going on. Fred, this is a pastor with Will in the background. Fernando, uh, these bags of cement, an average bag of cement weighs 160 pounds to 180 pounds. And I'm talking to him, and you can look at the wheel, look real good at the wheelbarrow. It's been welded, and they took the, the wooden handles off and put metal handles on it and welded it up. You can see it's in really good shape. And I'm telling them, it's like they're getting ready to pick up these bags of concrete, and I'm saying, use the wheelbarrow. These guys, and they're, they probably weigh 150 pounds soaking wet. They take these bags of cement, they flip them around on their backs, and they carry them. And I'm saying, no, you're going to hurt your back. And they're strong. They're really, really strong folks. You know, again, this is how we're pouring the bond beam here. They're taking their trowels, making sure they get all the, all the air out of it. Uh, the, Rich and I, uh, we didn't have tools for changing the blade, so we're uh, improvising. In this case, we're using a nail and a, and a screwdriver trying to take the screw off for a cut, saw, cut to replace the blade. This is how we carry our concrete. Five gallon buckets, about half full, throw them up on the wall, they pour them in, keep on going around. Um, this gentleman, uh, it's sort of interesting. He spent 20, year, 20 or 25 years in the, in the Cuban military, retired, and decided when he retired, he uh, was very frugal, frugal with his money, made sure he did stuff, and his goal now is he does missionary work while he's there. This is where they're building, um, this is where they're building the trusses. Um, you see the Oscar standing out there, uh, uh, and they're just getting ready. Um, this is not Will playing. He's trying to force the screw through the through the through the sheet metal. This, uh, the sheet metal, all the trusses together. And this is how we hang the trusses. Hang them upside down, and then we get to put the scaffolding next to them. Flip them up, hold them in place. Weld them, put supports. Add them with some of the sheathing. Here's Adam. Adam is here in this picture. He's welding the end truss. You you take the both end. You weld the truss into place. You can see the, the rebar that's there. He welds it up, and then we run, uh, what do they call them, uh, stringers out from here. You can see the little U-channels on the side here. See the little U-channel? They have the stringers that they run through there, and then they put the sheathing on. Jeremiah, Will and Jeremiah. It took them, the buildings we built were, on average, were about 26 by 52 and these guys would get it done in about four hours. That's putting up the trusses and then have it all sheathing and everything done in about four hours. Here they are working together, just, just putting the screws in, stuff like that. I took a picture of the chicken, and I thought, you know, I thought it was sort of interesting because my question to some of the Cuban people was, you know, why aren't you having a farm? Why don't you have a farm and then you can raise a garden? Who here besides me has raised a, everybody raised a garden here? plant vegetables, stuff like that. And I thought, you could have a garden. Just plant a garden, you know, plant some tomatoes, you can get, you can, uh, get more. And they said, no, you can't do that. Cause you, and, well, you can, but you have it. He goes, the government says, you're entitled to this much food. All the rest is ours, and we'll take it and distribute it to everybody else. That's how communism works. And I said, well, what about chickens? You get like, you know, get 50 chickens or 25 chickens, and you can get all these eggs. And he says, you get your five eggs a month, all the extra goes to the government, and they distribute them. 
So one of the things I think happens is they have their chickens running loose. Nobody owns a chicken. So if they find the eggs, guess, guess what happened? <laughs> I told you, they're innovative, right? They're very innovative people. It's really great. Here it is. They're doing a health seminar. The pastor was involved with that. This is Rujan. Uh, she's taking blood pressure. Uh, they also handed out uh, glasses. Uh, the, the, you know, they'd find out what, what the prescription was, what they needed. They'd issue them prescription glasses. They had a health seminar. Um, this is um, Tammy. Uh, what a great asset. Uh, Tammy and Rujan, my first comment to them, we're building blocks. These blocks are probably, I'm going to guess, between 25 and 30 pounds each. And uh, Tammy had double hip replacement last year, last fall. I'm saying, don't hurt yourself. I don't want. Uh, I really wish you wouldn't carry those blocks. And I told Rujan the same thing. And their comment was, "Mind your own business. Get to work." <laughs> so, all right, it's not a problem. <laughs> you know? All right, here's a pastor. He, he, of course, I don't know if you guys know, a pastor is a physical therapist or has a his trade was, and uh, he's doing some massage therapy here, and they enjoyed it. Um, This is our, uh, it says, um, and the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then it will come. Guys, as I, as um, um, I'm in my last, toward, uh, the last part of the presentation, um, I told you before, I, you know, that they gave more than I ever, than I received as far as a, as a blessing comes. And I, you know, I, I was talking to Rich when I'm in Cuba, and I'm seeing what's going on. I see the miracles, you know. Um, <laughs> we run out of bricks, out of blocks in one site. And so Rich uh, is saying, okay, we got to move the blocks to the next, the blocks, uh, some blocks from the one, another site to this site. And they said, well, what are you going to do? He goes, well, we're going to take these blocks over here, and we're going to load them up, and we're going to take them out over there. And so at 5 o'clock the next morning, there's a line of Cubans from here to the back of the church, and they're handing blocks like that. You know, they're swinging. That, that's, this is their mode of transportation. They take a block, they swing it, the guy stands there, takes it, they swing it, and they move them. And so we're moving blocks. And in 2001, I had a back surgery, and this is the blessing from God. You know, I had back surgery. I have a, an L4 and L5. L4 was ruptured, and L5 was bulging. And I'm, so I get in line, and I'm doing this, and uh, Rujan is a, a, the physician's assistant. She goes, the worst thing you can do for your back is twisting and lifting. I said, well, the Lord will watch over me. I didn't have any back aches, no problems, no numbness, nothing. You know, the Lord was blessing us. He is blessing our endeavor. You know, and it's just one thing after another. You know, as the pastor mentioned a minute ago, we go to a church and the the and the the, the guy who works for the city says, this isn't a garage because your doorway's not big enough. And he looks at your doorway, and the doorway's like what you, what you have here. He goes, it's not big enough. He goes, you, can't, you wouldn't have room for the trucks to come in. And Rich being the person, he says, he says, not a problem. We'll make a bigger doorway. You know, we want those trucks to get in, right? So he makes it wider. He makes it taller. We put the rebar around it, and it goes up. And I'm going to say it's probably roughly where that camera is on the back of your door here. You know, he makes this, you know, it's three rows higher than the normal doorway was. And we get it all fixed up, and we get in there. And, and we get all done, you look at it, and you picture it in your mind's eye about what it's going to look like with those great big doors in the front of the church. And all they did was made uh, entrance to their garage much more grander when we start worshiping in it. You know, and then they found out we go to the next site and we're working on the next site and he comes up to the attorney and he comes up to Rich and I'm standing there close by and he says, we know what you're doing and we're going to stop it right now. We're pulling your permit. And the attorney says, good. He goes, we're done. <laughs> we're done. We're, the, church, the building is done. And, and I'm looking at it and I'm amazed. I'm thinking, you don't think God had a hand in that? We were done with the building before they could pull the permit. You know, and we kept on moving on. We, Rich, to, uh, one of his comments is, my reverse is broke. I can't, get, I can't get away. Here's the pastor. Here, you know, the pastor was a busy man. He's working on concrete churches. He's working on health care. He's working on evangelism in the evening. You know, I'd get, a lot of times I would get ready to go to my room, and the pastor was working on a sermon for the next day 
for his evangelistic meeting. I get up in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, we're doing a personal worship, and he'd be sitting there working on with his on his laptop working. Uh, and he says, wait, I don't understand it. He goes, I usually have to struggle with what I gotta say here and what I'm gonna do for my for my sermon or for my evangelistic, because I'm you know, he did eight days of evangelism out of, out of the 14 or 16 days that we were there, and he says, it's just coming to me. He goes, I can't type it fast, as fast as it's coming to me. And, I, and he goes, I'm just, it's just coming to me. The Lord's telling me what to say. And this is his interpreter. His interpreter's talking to him as he's talking, and he's, and he's telling it. And the interpreter's like, I never heard this message before. He's enthused, they're excited. This was the original uh, interpreter. This guy, uh, and I wish I could remember his name off the top of my, my, my head. I can't. He says, uh, he was uh, actually, he's a, a Mexican national. He came to the United States illegally. They took him back. He came back again. Um, the third time, the second time, after the second time, he met Rich building a church in Mexico. Rich is building a church, and, and um, he comes in there and finds out what's going on, sees what, what we're doing, participates, meets, her, um, his, uh, meets a lady that's building the church with him, marries her, becomes a U.S. citizen, now he's a missionary and a minister for our church. <laughs> God had hand in that, by folks. Another one. This is our church. This, is a <clears throat> this church holds about 300 people. How do you like those pews? I never heard anyone complain about these are too hard. I don't have. I can't set them these for three hours. <laughs> yeah, and again, when they that they're in a standing room only, only when they get in there. This folks are asked me. I went to and I did a sermon in their church when I was there, and I'm talking to them, and they asked me if I go to the lady, the lady, the taller lady here, right here. Her mother was uh, like a coal porter in the area and go and talk and do services for people in church and stuff like that. And they, her mom was now bed, uh, bedridden. And they asked me if I'd come and pray with her. I said, absolutely. So we went there and it looked like my mother's sister laying in her bed. And I'm talking to them and they're saying, uh, I'm praying and talking to them. And, and like I said, there's nothing extravagant about their house. You know, they're very good. The guy in the red shirt, that's my interpreter. The lady in the in the in the black and white, the leopard skin, she's like the the head elder. She's the one that that started a church about it's about as wide as half of this church. She has like sixty members going to it. You know, and there's sta again, standing room only. And it's like they're saying his name's Rick, by the way. I remember his name. This is a beach in Cuba, beautiful beach. We, uh, they did take us out there. We're out there uh, looking around and uh, swimming. It's beautiful, real nice. Um, this is uh, this is our the driver for the car. They have a driver for the car in Cuba, and his wife. He's also an Adventist. As you're driving, as he picks you up, they go up there, and the, and the pastor picked up uh, Rujan. And she has a story. She tells that he's picking her up, and he he doesn't know what she does. She don't know who she is. He, he doesn't. And as he's driving her there, he's asking her, talking to her about accepting Jesus as her savior, making a change in her life. You know, so they're trying. He's trying to encourage everybody to do it because they know it's a better way of life. <clears throat> this is a uh, uh, some of the Cubans. Um, this guy is nothing short of fantastic. He is just. Um, He's actually a mechanic, and he's laying blocks, and I'll show you some more pictures. This is his son-in-law, again a Cuban, uh, hardworking, Fred, Rich, Oscar, Diasado. This is Rujan. Again, you see the black work behind her? Didn't stop her from working. There's your motorcycle, guys. I was telling you about you earlier. There's some of the guys, they see Jonathan up on the back behind, behind him. That's uh, and Jeremiah, and the pastor here. The pastor before the revolution owned businesses. He was very well off. Uh, he was excellent. After the revolution, they took everything away, um, and he became a pastor. <clears throat> he built. He would try to make a, po a point. He he would build churches. You're only allowed in, in Cuba. <coughs> excuse me, in Cuba, 
you have to put in for your vacation. And then you tell them when, and when you go to vacation, you got to tell them where you're going. And then so, and once you tell them, you tell them where you're going to do, where you're going. And then uh, they'll say, okay, you can go there. And you go. And then and when he went there, he built churches. That was his, that was his vacation, was building churches for the Lord. You know, um, this is a good road. That's why I took a picture of it in Cuba. It was sort of funny. I asked him, I was like, well, do you guys have good roads in, in the United States? I said, we have some bad roads. He goes, well, we have some good ones. <laughs> you know, and this, this is a picture. I, I thought it was noteworthy to take a picture of it. It's not uncommon to have potholes the size of this podium in the middle of the road. You know, this is Diasalo. We're mixing mud again. Um, this is we're carrying mud back and forth. Um, laying the ball. As you can see, you know, you know um, very determined. And uh, this gentleman, um, this is the, uh, how I want to say it, this is how they work. You see this gentleman, this is how you work in Cuba. You lay blocks. I, I didn't lay any blocks. But if you see something needs done, then you do it. Now, this gentleman, he saw that they needed they were going to need mud. No one was mixing mud, so he gets off the wall and goes over and starts mixing mud because they had extra block layers. And then once he saw that I needed block layers, uh, they were mixing mud. I saw him mixing mud, so I went and helped him. And after, after we got the mud mixed up and we got carried enough where we had a couple buckets on the wall there, then we look around and see that they need more blocks. So then we go over and grab blocks, and you start throwing them up on the wall. You know, because if you don't keep everybody supplied, the church doesn't get done, and the word has to go out. Am I right? Do you guys, do you guys believe that we're in the end of time, end times? I'm amazed. I'm talking to someone last week. I'm in, I was in, in uh, Missouri, and the guy says, I don't know. He goes, I'm, he wasn't a church member, and I'm just talking. I'm on the street, and we're just having a conversation, and he says, do you guys, do you realize? He goes, we're at the end of time. You know, people who aren't going to church are talking about this. And, and, and this is our time to step up and say, hey, let's get you prepared. All right? Let's get prepared. Let's do that. Um, again, this is a guy. Uh, he was a block layer, and again, he was grabbing a saw. Uh, Oscar is mixing. This is their church. 50 members. This is just one part of the church. Here's the other part. This is their church. You know, I asked them, I said, how long has this church been here? 50 years. 50 members, 50 years. The guy built it himself. That guy that was on the motorcycle, he built this church. You know, I think they need a new one. What do you think? There it is. We built them another church. And you know how, you know how inspiring it is? You're getting this building done, and you're getting in there, <clears throat> we're getting ready to put the roof. The next day, we're putting the roof on there. Um, we're looking at we're looking at the building. We're making sure everything's done, so you don't want anything to hurt anybody get hurt. And then they come up here and they give it. And now the people from the congregation are walking up to you and they're shaking their hands and they think, "Thank you so much for our building. Thank you so much for blessing us with a place to worship." Things that we take for granted, you know. And it's like, you know how that makes you feel? You know? <clears throat> Here it is. You can see the church off the side there. That's the back side of the church. Oh, excuse me. This is the this is the back side. That's the back side of the church. This is the new garage that they're gonna be having church in. <laughs> You can see uh, right here, there it is. Those people are excited about that building. They're going to put bars in the windows. They'll put doors in front of it. Um, in fact, I have pictures now. They're actually having worship service inside of it now. You know, and they're saying, well, you know, if you look down, some people would say, oh, the floors aren't done or anything. They're not done. You know, the church are the people. It's not the building. The building's just keeping the rain and the sun off them during the day. You know, it's a beat, and you, it's so neat. You know, they're taking our leftover lumber from what we had for a building, and they made them into pews, and that's what they're sitting on. And they're happy to do it. Isn't that amazing? 
this is out of order. I should have had this earlier. This is all of us standing there, uh, getting together, having a picture taken. This is me at the airport. Um, I thought it was sort of fit fitting. The pastor and I spent the night at the airport in Philadelphia, and I'm walking through there, and I saw the Liberty Bell, and I thought, hey, this is pretty cool. You know, let's take a picture of the, of the Liberty Bell. And I'm, I'm thinking, it's like, the Liberty Bell shouldn't be in the airport. And then as I got closer, it's Legos. <laughs> it's Legos. But again, you know, you know we, have a, we have something in the United States we call freedom. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of, you know, don't take those freedoms for granted. You know, people if you, in Cuba, when you speak out against the government, they disappear. I'm not saying they die, but they disappear. They don't know where they go. You know, we don't have that issue. Hard work. I was there, I was there for 16 days. That's what my gloves looked at, like after five. I wasn't alone. Hard work. You know, and the, the Cuban people saw me wearing gloves and they says, can you get me some of these? And they said, let me check. So I went back to Pastor Ricky. He said, hey, can you get some gloves? He went to the black market. He goes, how many do you need? I said, I said, I want at least two dozen. And I'm thinking, you know, and I'm thinking American. Well, a pair of leather gloves cost here in the United States and U.S. $10 a pair? $20 a pair? Yeah. You know what they are in Cuba? $1.57 a pair. I yeah. And it's like, yeah, we'll get gloves. Yeah. And um, I'm looking at these folks, and it wasn't myself, there's several, I was looking at these folks working. And has anyone other than I, anyone else working construction here? All right. Now, how important are your shoes in construction? So I'm looking at their, I'm working, working with these folks, these Cubans, and the whole front of their toes are gone. They're gone. And I'm, I'm saying, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, these guys need shoes. They're going to work, they need shoes. And I didn't realize there's more than I, I was the only one thinking that. So we get to Pastor Ricky and say, find out what it costs for shoes. So he gets around, so we take up a collection and we say, get these guys some shoes. So the Cubans got together and they come back and they said, we want to talk to the guys who are, to you, to Americans that are doing this. It's like, okay. So we go over there and sit down and we talk. And they said, well, we think our shoes, our work shoes are good enough. We're wondering if you care if we would buy, send that money to buy our shoes for church. That's important to them. How they look when they go to church is important. They wear their best when they come to church. I thought, wow. Wow. I said, not a problem. And they got the church shoes. So it's call unto me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. We're getting ready to hop on a truck. We're getting all of our supplies. We're going from one site to another. We're loading everything up on this truck. We're throwing it all up there. We're getting loaded up and stuff like that. And then... <clears throat> he goes, okay, everybody, we get, it's in the back of a dump truck. We all know what a dump truck is, right? So we get in the back of a dump truck. We load our supplies in the back of a dump truck. They load us up in the back of the dump truck. And Rich, before they close the door in the back of a dump truck, he goes, Americanos, keep your head down. Okay, Rich, what's going on? You know, I've been with Rich for many, many years. What's going on? What, why, why do we have to keep our head down? They're looking for us. They want to shut us down. I was like, whoa. So, you know, in the back of a dump truck, you can stand up, look over, stuff like that. That's sort of funny. Jonathan, Jonathan Benson, he goes and finds a wheelbarrow, leans back in it, goes to sleep. We get halfway, we get to a checkpoint. They say, we want to look in the back of your truck, open it up, and there we are. You know, so they, they didn't notice the Americans in with the Cubans. He says, oh, that's good. Go on. You don't think the Lord was there? That was, you don't think the Lord was taking care of us, watching us? It's like, wow. We have a lot of stories. I wish the rest of the gang was here, the rest of the group was here. 
Guys, if you have a chance, go on a mission trip. From my experience, is it'll light a fire in your heart that you won't be able to put out. I'm asking Rich when I'm sitting there and I'm talking to him and asking about how he got, Rich has been doing this for 35 years. You know, anywhere from one to five churches, six churches being built at a time. And so he's built, I can say, I would say, if I say hundreds of churches. I asked him, I said, well, Rich, why'd you start building churches? He says, I was looking around, Lloyd, and he was, I've seen that a lot of our young kids, our young kids, our youth, he goes, half of all of our youths were falling away from the church. He goes, I, there had to be a better way. And he goes, the Lord showed me this. Get them involved with missions. Get them out there. I don't find out what there, what's out there. Get, them, get that fire lit in our hearts. And he says, ah, oh. he goes, I've had so many kids come up there. He says, oh, this is so great. And so he started the Mexico Mission and Beyond program. It doesn't, it's not that expensive. For each person, it's about $350 to go to Cuba. For, for us, it was like 16 days, $350. If you have a family, there, he gives you a discount, I'm not sure. I think it's like $270. Um, and right now in Cadillac, in Cadillac uh, they've got a 40-yard container, a shipping container they're trying to fill up with supplies for Cuba. When he doesn't fill up, he's going to take uh, donations and he's going to buy food to give to the Cuban, take with us to the Cuban, to the Cuban people. This is Rich's stuff. Changing lives through short-term missions. You know, there are long-term changes for short-term mission. You know, um, and the Lord doesn't exempt, you know, I, I thought for many times, I thought, Early on in my first, just did my, I did my first missionary outreach in 98, 99, 2000, 2001. Did four of them right in a row. And I didn't do anything until this year in February. And we went. And then, you know, I realized what I missed. You know, I thought, and at one point in time, I thought, well, everybody should do this. But, you know, I'm finding that everybody has a role to play. We need people to support Mexico missions and their outreach programs. You know, we're not going to be done just today. We're going to be going on for a long time, forever, until the Lord comes. And you know what? And this is what I tell my church members. When I get, when I come up and the Lord brings me out of the grave and I look up and I see him coming in the sky of heaven, my feet are going to leave the ground. And I want to see everybody.